the first thing I should say is I spend a lot more time on the grandfather than the grandson here for a couple of reasons. Uh, a big one, frankly, is I haven't done enough research on the grandson yet. Um, but the grandfather plays a, a significant role in my dissertation project, uh, which is the main thing I've done so far uh, with this topic. Um, before I get into uh, the paper, I thought I should take several minutes and talk about the background of what I'm talking about because I'm, going to assume, I'm not going to assume that all of you know all of the, th the events leading up to uh, what I am getting into here. Uh, so I thought I would very, very briefly cover the background story before we get into the paper itself. Um, and I'm going to pick up just after the Revo American Revolutionary War. Um, at the end of the American Revolution, the effective geographic dividing line between American settlers and Native Americans in what was called the Northwest Territory at this time is the Ohio River, okay, which is the blue uh, line here. Uh, the particular group I'm going to focus on, the Wyandotte, have villages throughout what's now central Ohio and especially in Northwest Ohio and also uh, just outside of Detroit, the Ford at Detroit in Michigan. Throughout the 1780s, uh, the United States, uh, being an expansionist nation and heavily reliant on Western land for income, uh, attempted to sign a series of treaties with people north and west of the river. So they're crossing over into what's now Southeast Ohio mainly and signing treaties with uh, usually a village or two of Native American peoples. The problem uh, with this was, uh, these individual villages didn't have absolute claim to any of this territory. Uh, in any given space that's being ceded by treaty, there are usually dozens of villages, and only one, two, or maybe three are actually participating in signing these treaties. The other thing is, frankly, the people who did sign the treaties often argued they were being compelled to do so because, you know, a hundred or so Americans would come into the village heavily armed demanding a treaty conference. Okay. But by virtue of these treaties, American settlers start to cross over and settle on the north side of the Ohio River in the late 1780s. Okay. This prompted conflict and eventually a war breaks out between the United States and a coalition of native people living in this region, including the Wyandotte, the main focus of my talk. Uh, this war has no name. It never got an official name in the United States. Um, native peoples have various names for the conflicts that happen. Uh, but often this is just called the Northwest Indian War, or some call it President Washington's Indian War, since he happened to be president at the time. Uh, between 1790 and 1795, we have a series of conflicts uh, between American forces and this Native American coalition, which is made up of uh, several dozen villages which comprise about nine different ethnic groups, nine different cultural groups. <clears throat> uh, if you know anything at all about this war, uh, one of the key battles was fought in 1791, the battle that has no name, and at that battle, American forces commanded by the governor of the territory, a guy named Arthur St. Clair, he was the governor of the Northwest Territory, uh, suffers the worst defeat an American force ever suffered at the hands of Native Americans, statistically. Okay. Of his 1,400 men, nearly 1,000 were killed, wounded, or captured. Okay. That's about four times as many as at the Little Bighorn, for comparison. Okay. <clears throat> Temporarily, up till about 1793, uh, this native coalition dominates on the ground. They win every significant battle, and they actually drive most of the settlers that had crossed over the river back into Kentucky and Virginia. <clears throat> but in the process of negotiation, the US tried to negotiate an end to this war, but part of the negotiation was you had to recognize the treaties that Native people didn't and had no reason to because they hadn't lost anything yet. Uh, 
President Washington mobilizes a new and better army commanded by a general named Anthony Wayne, a very significant figure in this region's history. Um, Wayne and his army, in 1794 mainly, march steadily into what is now the state of Ohio. They march up the major waterways in the western part of the state and build forts every few miles, basically laying claim to the territory and extending their supply lines so they can fight this coalition in a major battle. The battle took place, uh, it's called the Battle of Fallen Timbers. That one has a name because the US won the battle. Um, which took place near uh, modern Toledo, Ohio, in extreme northwest Ohio. At this battle, Wayne's army uh, thoroughly defeated the coalition forces. Okay. In the process, the coalition members who survived the initial battle fled the field and went to a nearby fort, which was manned by the British. The British still had forts on the American side of the border at this time. Uh, the British had promised if their friends were in need, they would shelter them in their fort. But when the coalition forces showed up, they locked the doors and wouldn't let them in. This led to more deaths and, more importantly, led to a lack of faith in their British allies. Now, the British weren't actively fighting in this war, but they had promised to aid uh, native peoples in a non-military way and had failed to do so. Okay. So after the Battle of Fallen Timbers, for the next eight months or so, a series of native leaders try to broker a peace agreement with Wayne. Okay? One of the key figures in this story is the man in the illustration uh, at the right, uh, a Wyandotte chief named Tarhee. Okay? Uh, Tarhee was one of the principal speakers at the Treaty of Greenville. Um, and a key leader in this part of the world in terms of uh, political power. Tarhi and others brokered a peace deal, and all of the major leaders of the Native Coalition agree to it. The peace that they negotiated is called the Treaty of Greenville. What happened as a result of this treaty is the following. I'll show you an illustration of it here. The Treaty of Greenville caused Native Americans to cede not just this part of Ohio they already had ceded by those treaties, but everything below this line to the United States. So American victory led to a serious territorial session by the Native coalition. What happened was all Native people were expected to move north of the line. And it's going to cluster these people who are spread all throughout what's now the state of Ohio into this corner, and that's going to rapidly lead to depopulation of game, and it's gonna make traditional lifestyles harder to maintain long term. So you have these territorial restrictions in place. On top of that, you have the official federal policy towards native peoples. Since the founding of the United States, uh, Americans had debated different strategies for their approach to relations to native people. Okay. Uh, in my classes, I boil it down to really there are four main choices. One, you could leave native people alone. <laughs> a few people talked about that, but that was never a serious possibility because the United States needed Western land at, the, at its core. That's the problem. A second approach was to fight wars of conquest, and that was certainly discussed also. But those wars would be costly in terms of manpower and money. That's a big consideration. And I don't want to dismiss it totally. There is some moral objection from some Americans to conquering native peoples. Okay. So leave alone, not going to work. Conquest, we're not in a position yet for that. Removal was another possibility, trying to move native people off of their lands further west. This was more appealing to more Americans. The problem in 1780s, 1790s America is they don't have the power to do that yet. Okay? And they don't have a place to send people yet. Only the Louisiana Purchase makes that possible because part of Thomas Jefferson's rationale for buying Louisiana was it could be a dumping ground for native peoples from the east. They could be moved there. Okay? 
But in this period, 1780s, 1790s, early 1800s, the course that the federal government chose is what is classically just called the civilization program. So if you're not gonna move, not gonna fight, not gonna leave alone, change is the alternative, okay? And the civilization program was designed by two men mostly, President Washington and the Secretary of War, Henry Knox. Fort Knox, Kentucky named after him, you've heard of that. Um, that's notable to take, to keep in mind. Native affairs are under the War Department, okay, at this point in history, which kind of tells us what the thinking is about the future. Okay? It's not under the State Department. So the Secretary of State doesn't manage Native Affairs, the Secretary of War does. Okay? Well, this civilization program had, if, if you want to boil it down simply, a single goal in mind, and it was to assimilate Native people. Okay? Uh, by assimilate, what I mean is to absolutely change Native people into white people. Okay? Uh, there's a video I've shown in my classes of a Cherokee man talking about this, and he says they wanted to make us brown white people. I mean, that's effectively what the process is supposed to be. So the end goal is supposed to be absolute assimilation. There are lots of reasons for that. Uh, humanitarian reasons said that will give Native people a future in the United States. But material reasons said if Native people become quote unquote civilized, they won't need that much land anymore and that will liquidate huge amounts of their territory for sale. Okay. So, after the Treaty of Greenville, some, including Tar Heels, a good example, attempt to adapt selective aspects of American life. That's important, it's an important emphasis I always tell uh, students in classes. Very few to know Native people want to assimilate. Some are willing to change meaning men will start farming rather than women. Traditionally in these communities, women did all the farming. Okay. Men will become more dominant politically, reflecting American politics in some ways. Okay. Before this, in most communities we're talking about, women had the right to vote. Okay. <clears throat> but few to no native people want to be brown white people. Okay. That will become important as we get going into the story. You may know, because this is one of the things I think most U.S. history classes deal with when they, if they bring Native Americans into it. By 1805 or so, a movement begins in this region again to oppose American expansion and to oppose the changes that are going on uh, with some Native people in the 1790s, early 1800s. It is led by a pair of brothers, Shawnee men, one is named Tenskwatawa or Tenskwatawa, people, even Shawnee people disagree on the pronunciation, and his brother Tecumseh. Okay. Tenskwatawa is a religious leader, Tecumseh is a military leader. And they form a coalition to try to oppose American expansion, oppose any new treaty making, selling any more land, oppose cultural change, and make a new alliance with the British in Canada. Okay. So that's going on 1805 to 1812. Okay. Some Wyandotte people do join this new coalition, but the majority, including most of the tribal leaders, people like Tarhi, refuse. There are lots of reasons I won't get into here, but the bottom line is they're committed to at least some adaptation, and they don't view any real possibility for this coalition working long term. Okay. And a guy like Tarhi made a big point of this. He didn't trust the British. The British had failed a few years before. What's going to make it any different now? Okay. Uh, Tarhi famously took his British medals he had gotten, struck his knife on them, and threw them on the ground at a treaty meeting, saying, I, I denounce the British, my old friends. Not for very long. But... That led directly, this movement of Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa leads directly into the War of 1812. It's one of the major causes of the War of 1812. Okay. The Wyandots in Ohio, for the most part, remain neutral in the war. Tarhi and others urge this. The US government urged it. The US government said, just stay out of it. We don't need you. Okay. 
What happened though, since the Wyandotte at this time are living right here, and the fighting is going on right here, it's decided that they're too close to the front lines. They're too close to the battlefield both for their safety and for American assurances that they're not going to join the enemy, the Wyandotte are moved, are relocated during the war south near what is now Dayton, Ohio, right over here, okay, and basically monitored by American officials. Okay. So they're relocated uh, from their territory into actually some of their old territory a little bit. <clears throat> After that first year, though, uh, both the Wyandotte and the United States military decide they would like for some native men to be given the opportunity to fight in the war. So in 1813, the US Army, commanded by William Henry Harrison, future president of the United States, agrees to take the Wyandotte and other loyal native peoples as volunteers mainly to use as scouts and negotiators to try to get other native people to stop fighting. <clears throat> Dozens of Wyandotte men, including Tarhi, who was probably about 70 when this is going on, go and actually fight in the war. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you may know this, during the war, 1813, Harrison invades Ontario, Canada. He crosses over from Detroit, captures a significant portion of Ontario, U.S. forces eventually burn the capital at York. Tecumseh dies in 1813 during this invasion. And the Wyandotte, who joined Harrison, uh, Harrison gave them a lot of credit for persuading Native people to give up fighting against them sooner, to negotiate peace, which was really their principal purpose in the Army anyway. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I should mention the painting at the bottom. This is a very famous depiction of the signing of the Treaty of Greenville uh, by a very famous 20th century artist, Howard Chandler Christie. He had a, a figure called the Christie Girl. It was used in advertising and World War I propaganda. He painted the most commonly used painting of the Constitution, the signing of the Constitution, which you see in most textbooks. Um, this hangs at the rotunda of the Ohio State House today, this particular painting. So, to bring this to a close and get into my actual paper here, um, we have to talk a little bit about what's happening right after the war ends. Um, I, f I find in, in most US history classes, we don't spend a lot of time on the War of 1812, which I think actually does a disservice to how important it was to Americans at the time. Uh, some consider it a second revolution. This actually completed what the revolution had started in a lot of ways. It's incredibly significant to native people east of the Mississippi River because after the war, many Native Americans recognized they must change quicker <laughs> because, simply put, there is more pressure on them to change faster and there's more pressure on them to cede their land. Okay? So Native American efforts to acculturate or adapt are increasing after the war, but the attrition of lands continues. Federal negotiators come in and chip away at the native land base after the War of 1812 pretty quickly. Okay. If you look at a, you know, a list of treaties, most treaties between the United States and native people are signed between about 1805 and 1835. Not all of them, but the vast majority are. <clears throat> The Wyandotte, a very small group, I'll talk about size uh, shortly, they signed no less than nine treaties in that period, nine separate agreements. Okay. <clears throat> the big thing in terms of American perspectives on Native people after the war, many are seriously contemplating removal now. Uh, one reason is very simple. Native Americans are not a military threat in the East anymore especially since the British have promised not to interfere in American affairs anymore, which they don't after 1812. <clears throat> so the pressure to remove is, is amping up, and we'll get into that more a bit later. But the other thing that's happening, uh, especially with the Wyandotte community I'm gonna spend my time with today, is missionary activities are also increasing. Now missionaries had been active amongst native peoples uh, since the colonial period, 
But really, it's in the early 19th century that missionary activity takes off in what was the west of that time, west of the Appalachian Mountains. <clears throat> the Wyandots had had contact with missionaries before. Uh, there had been a Presbyterian mission uh, for a few years in the early 1800s. Uh, Quakers had been involved off and on with the Wyandots for a few years. But it's really in 1816 that the, the key Christian mission is established here. In that same year, 1860, and then there was a second agreement in 1817, the pressure to sign treaties is intense on the Wyandotte and their neighbors. I'll show you the result of that in just a second. At that same time, just as the first treaty had been signed, uh, a stranger showed up. Okay? He was variously described as a Negro or a mulatto. Uh, he probably was part African and part native, actually. And his name was John Stewart. Stewart, not the Daily Show guy. John Stewart okay, um, was what, what is called a lay preacher. He was not ordained by the Methodist Church, but he had enough knowledge of Methodism to preach. Um, officially, he is called an exhorter. That means you can preach, but you can't perform rites like marriage. Okay. <clears throat> well, Stewart showed up, a stranger from the South. He was from Virginia. Uh, initially, some Wyandots thought he was a runaway slave. There had been many of those that had come to them over the years. In fact, there was a black town next to uh, the major Wyandot town. It's called Negro Town. Okay. <clears throat> but Stewart was a free person and particularly came to the Wyandots to preach. Okay. And he had troubles early on. People weren't willing to interpret for him. He found an interpreter who also actually happened to be African American who had been adopted by the Wyandotte at a young age. Um, when he interpreted, he would basically say, I don't believe what he's saying, but here's what he says. <laughs> he, keeps, he keeps saying, I don't believe any of this, but I'm going to keep telling you what he's saying anyway. <clears throat> well, Stewart's unofficial mission within about three years becomes an official Methodist mission. The Methodist Church takes over the mission. Stewart continues to preach there. They eventually ordain him as an official minister. But they also send a series of white missionaries to supervise the mission. Okay? So this is the first Methodist mission to Native Americans anywhere. It's what happening is happening right here. A key observer who will come up a few times in my talk is a missionary who was here the longest of any, a guy named James Finley. Finley was uh, with the Wyandots from 1819 to 1826, okay, which covers a lot of the period I'm going to talk about in the paper. And he wrote extensively after this. He, is the, he writes the most material about the Wyandots in this period of anyone by far. He also was later the uh, official minister of the state penitentiary in Ohio. wrote about that too, if you're interested in prison stuff. In the course of this mission being established, and I'm talking about it for a few minutes because it plays a part in the paper, um, several prominent Wyandotte men particularly convert to Christianity. Okay? The two most important, arguably, are two of the chiefs on the council. The guy on the left is named Between the Logs, and the guy on the right is named Mononkyu. Okay? These guys became basically mobile proof that the mission was working. They were used as essentially propaganda to raise money for the mission. They were sent east to New York so they could meet with the Missionary Society. They traveled down to Baltimore and Washington, D.C., and were used uh, to fundraise, effectively, for the Wyandotte mission. And it was pretty, pretty effective, actually. Eventually, by 1824, a church was built using partially missionary funds, partially Wyandotte money, and partially federal money. Okay, they combined, each put in a third, to build this church, which still stands at Upper Sandusky today. Okay. So those territorial changes I was talking about, I, you already saw the Greenville map, I talked about that. But by 1817, it looks like this. Okay. What was once all native territory is now a smattering of small reservations. Okay. Uh, the Wyandots have two and part of another of these. 
The one I'm going to focus on, which is where my main uh, character in my paper is living, is what's called the Grand Reserve. It's the largest of these and the capital of the Wyandotte Nation, which is called Upper Sandusky. Sandusky is the river that it sits upon. And another town I think I'll mention a few times is Lower Sandusky, which is up here. You say, why is upper above lower? Because the river flows that way. <laughs> so this is upriver, that's downriver. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about my paper. Okay, and I'll do more of a reading here. Uh, but I, we have the advantage of having a lot of images by this point. Most of my work, we're not to photography yet, so it's always a difficulty. Um, the main figure in my paper, there are no existing images of. There are no paintings, and he died before photography. <laughs> okay. And that's Isaac Walker. He'll play a key role here. Um, here are a couple of his brothers. He had three brothers who were significant to the story. Uh, by far more famous than Isaac Walker is his brother William. This is William Walker Jr. Their father was William Walker. Um, he was a chief of the Wyandotte Nation, an elected chief. They had elections after the 1830s. He also was the first governor of Nebraska Territory. Okay. Another brother of Isaac is Joel Walker. He's mentioned a few times in the paper. His son, so Isaac Walker's son, is this guy, Isaiah Walker. <laughs> I don't really talk much about him at all. And then I kind of jump in the end of the paper to talk about his son, or the grandson of Isaac Walker, which is this guy, Bertrand Walker, also called Hento. Okay. And I'll get into them briefly. One of the most telling and interesting stories of identity on the Grand Reserve involves the most prolifically documented, if not the most important, family on the Grand Reserve. A dominant trope in the literature regarding Native American history, particularly in this period, the early Republican period, is the story of the intercultural broker. Okay? These are people usually either of mixed racial ancestry or individuals predominantly raised or educated by the other, so a Native person raised by Americans, an American raised by Native people. These are people who are considered go-betweens culturally. So they're able to exist in both societies is the idea. Okay? Um, if you know literature, Last of the Mohicans or the, the James Fenimore Cooper books, the main character, Natty Bumpo, is kind of a go-between character, just to give you some idea. These go-betweens could exist, maybe not always comfortably, but they could exist in both worlds, the world of Native people and the world of Americans. Okay? Despite this ability to move from culture to culture, a lot of scholars, James Merrill is one of the most important, have argued in a convincing manner that such cultural go-betweens, quote, even old hands who bragged of their talents, never really wanted and never were permitted to unravel the mystery of Indian ways, end quote. He makes a similar argument about native people who go the other way, that they have a knowledge of the other culture but are never really part of the other group. Often prominent in records kept by traders, missionaries, and government officials, the stories of cultural brokers are typically the best known and oft retold by scholars who have considered indigenous white interactions since. One individual who seems to fit within this idiom is Isaac Walker, the main character in my story here. Walker played a brief but notable role in the history of the Wyandotte community along the Sandusky River in the first decades of the 19th century. On the surface, Walker seems an archetype of the cultural broker. But I'm going to argue here that Walker, if anything, fashioned his own identity, both as a Wyandotte and a white man concurrently, but also not either in some ways. Rather than being torn between two worlds, he worked within the existing structure to forge his own world, one that required no real movement on his part. In essence, from the known scattered bits of his story that I'll lay out here, emerges an individual who is comfortable being his own man, living as someone made possible in this unique genetic and cultural stew of the 19th century trans-Appalachian frontier. Walker's family held an interesting place in the social workings of the Wyandotte community. His father, I mentioned, is William Walker Sr., no pictures of him either, was a captive from a large Virginia European family. 
He had been acquired early on by the nation in trade. He had been taken by the Delaware, sold to the Wyandotte, and the Wyandotte adopted him as a member of their community. As an adult, William Sr. held various positions on the US government payroll, including serving for a time as an Indian agent, an interpreter, and as the postmaster uh, at near Detroit, initially. Isaac's mother, William's wife, was a woman named Catherine uh, Rankin. Her father was a prominent British trader associated with the Hudson's Bay Company, the biggest trading company in British Canada. And her mother was a woman named Catherine Montour from a prominent Iroquoian family. Isaac was born of this marriage near Detroit in 1794. Now his father, remember, in if you want to use racial terms, they wouldn't have then, was not by blood Wyandotte. His mother was no more than a quarter Wyandotte by blood. Okay? So Isaac, if you want to use blood quantum, which they didn't at this time yet, was no more than an eighth Wyandotte by blood. <clears throat> Isaac Walker, born near Detroit in 1794, grew up largely on his father's land near Brownstown, which is a Wyandotte town just south of Detroit. During the War of 1812, Isaac, his father, an older brother that I didn't mention here, and an uncle, escaped capture by the British and joined the Americans at Detroit. Their land was actually on both sides of the river, so they were on both sides of the boundary, the Detroit River. And his father was uh, subject of arrest and managed to escape with much of his family to the American lines. The British destroyed his father's property. <clears throat> what we know about Isaac's education is sketchy, but we definitely know he attended a mission school that the Presbyterians ran at Upper Sandusky between 1809 and 1811. Okay? He most certainly was there. <clears throat> uh, the school closed as the War of 1812 broke out and never reopened. But he also certainly would have gotten education other places. His father was literate, so he certainly would have been teaching him. Uh, there's some evidence he was taught partially in Canada also. Um, as I mentioned, though, Isaac Walker, according to kind of the, the beginnings of blood quantum ideas, there, there's discussion of blood fraction, but it's not quite developed yet, was likely no more than one-eighth Wyandotte. He and his siblings successfully asserted during their adulthood that they were a quarter Wyandotte. That's important because eventually anyone below a quarter blood is not considered a member of the nation. Okay, So that's a significant assertion. Um, <clears throat> Regardless of these future complications, their mother's membership in the nation, uh, her membership in a clan, she's part of the Big Turtle Clan, which is the biggest clan amongst the Wyandots, um, and the acceptance of their father as an adoptee made Isaac and his siblings members of the nation and recognized as such by the community. Okay, so their blood quantum ultimately didn't matter because community recognition uh, was there. Walker's life as a member of the Wyandotte Nation reveals complicated, uh, the complicated nature of his personal identity as economic uh, activity. Isaac Walker made a substantial part of his living by working for the United States government, usually as an interpreter. That was his typical role. Walker, along with his father William, his brother William Jr., and a small handful of other men held distinct advantages in a community where very few spoke English with any level of fluency and even fewer could write English. Isaac and his father and his brothers could all read and write English. They also spoke Wyandotte and they also spoke other Iroquoian languages like Seneca as well. <clears throat> Isaac and his father in particular seem to have attained the greatest favor of the United States by the latter 1810s, especially again since they were not only bilingual, but they were literate as well. The Walkers also seem to have been preferred interlocutors by the Wyandotte leadership. They were appealed to by Wyandots who only spoke Wyandotte to be their voice, their pen in English. The leadership put a great trust and reliance in both William Sr. and Isaac. Isaac was particularly vital to the efforts to complete the 1816-1817 treaties I talked about, which extinguished most tribal land claims, excluding a, a few small reservations. 
Isaac and his father played a significant role in negotiating the treaty and in the bargaining that took place regarding the size and location of the reserve lands. Some observers criticized the Walkers for inhibiting the treaty and encouraging the Wyandotte leaders to reject it because they didn't think it was a good enough deal. But the family emerged from the negotiations, if anything, with a stronger position in the community and with the United States government. To formally conclude the treaty, Isaac conducted a party of the chiefs from, Wa from Wyandotte territory to Washington in 1817. He served as their interpreter and guide, effectively, on the journey, demonstrating the young man's important role in fostering the agreements that led to uh, this diplomatic treaty uh, session. No matter the turnover in chiefs, Indian agents, or federal administrations, Isaac Walker and his kin remained important players in the local level operations of the U.S. government on the Grand Reserve, making their livings in significant ways through the American colonial apparatus. They had the specialized knowledge, business connections, and historical precedent necessary to both the Wyandotte leaders and the government agents assigned to the reserve. Throughout the 1820s, Isaac was consistently employed as an interpreter for various councils and whenever his father was unavailable. Following the death of William Sr. in 1823, Isaac seemed poised to take his place as the full-time government interpreter. It's one of the best paying jobs. It's actually the best paying job on the reservation. However, the U.S. Indian agent, fearing alienating other prominent families, decided to split the interpreter duties between Isaac and a man named Robert Armstrong. Armstrong was an adoptee, as William Sr. was, and headed a very prominent mixed-race family. Okay? So the interpreter decided to cut both of the major mixed families into this uh, interpreter deal. Isaac complained repeatedly about this arrangement, citing the lack of a living wage. He made $240 in 1824, for example. Most full-time interpreters made between $350 and $500. And the fact that his proximity to the agency, several miles closer than Armstrong's, caused him to bear the bulk of the interpreting duties. So whenever someone showed up, they would go to Isaac first because he was closer. Despite their rivalry for the office, Walker and Armstrong both contributed in valuable ways to, the, to the, both the functions of the agency and to ethnographic research ongoing with the Wyandots at this time. Both men provided information about the Wyandot language to the American Philosophical Society, who were attempting to catalog indigenous languages in the 1810s. Uh, they also gave their opinion of uh, Gabriel Sigard, a, a French priest, his interpretations uh, and translations of the Huron Wendat language. Okay? So they also were basically participants in critiquing uh, older efforts to try to catalog the Wyandotte language. <clears throat> Walker therefore exerted a political proved to be an intellectual and political force on the reserve. In addition to his duties with the agency in the 1820s, Walker also co-owned and operated the family tavern and store, which was right at the edge of the Grand Reserve. It was close enough that white people would cross over to shop there, but it mainly serviced a Wyandotte clientele. The Isaac's father had built the store, which was usually just called the Walker Place, with the approval of the Wyandotte Council several years before. The store served as a primary source of American consumer goods on the reserve. Upon William Sr.'s death, the store was left half to his son Isaac and half to his widow Catherine. Isaac, uh, being the eldest living child in Ohio, uh, was therefore responsible not just for his own well-being, but helping his mother to raise his minor brothers, uh, Joel and... Um, <clears throat> Matthew, Joel and Matthew Walker. Isaac devoted a significant amount of time and money to improving both the business and surrounding farmland throughout the 1820s. He built on an addition onto the house to accommodate his family and more customers, while also enclosing a significant amount of land in fencing to accommodate more livestock. I found no hard numbers about the volume of business or amount of cash coming into Isaac's hands, but his profit must have been enough to offset the deficiency of his interpreter's pay, as well as to provide the support of his family, his mother, and his younger brothers, Joel and Matthew. 
Additionally, the symbolic importance of Walker as a conduit of American economic consumerism on the reserve can't be ignored. In place of the defunct government trading houses, which had gouged Wyandotte customers, frankly, before the War of 1812, these stores operated by men like Isaac Walker served as a major source of manufactured goods, an outlet for indigenous cash at competitive prices to surrounding white uh, enterprises. Along with their political and economic role in standing in the community, the Walkers became intimately involved with the various cultural and social activities on the reserve, particularly the various missionaries who visited the Wyandots in the early 19th century. I've talked a bit about that already. In his youth at the Lower Sandusky Mission, Isaac appears to have served not just as a student, but as an interpreter as well. So he actually interpreted while being a student in the classes. <clears throat> He made note in those early years that Christianity had a marked effect on the few Wyandots who attended, though he does not seem to have devoted himself uh, to Christian practice. After the War of 1812, Walker's mother, Catherine, was one of the first and most devout adherents to the new Methodist mission. And by the early 1820s, Isaac, though apparently still skeptical of the motives of the Methodist at first, became a stalwart interpreter, adherent, and a founding member of the Methodist Missionary Society the Wyandots formed in 1828. By that time, most of the Wyandot leaders, as well as a significant percentage of the general population, affiliated in some way with the Methodist Church, either as official members or regular attendees at services. And Walker took a leading role as an interpreter for the Methodist preachers, none of whom I should mention ever learned Wyandotte. Okay. <clears throat> In summing up Isaac's relationship with the Methodists, James Finley, who I mentioned, the longtime missionary, wrote in Isaac's obituary that he was, quote, often employed in interpreting the gospel to the wonders of his own nation, when his own heart became filled with its important truths, end quote. Additional evidence of his religious interpretation and skill also comes from Anon Q, who I showed you a picture of earlier, a chief on the tribal council at early convert to Methodism, who asserted that after receiving a Bible from a Methodist minister, he, quote, took it to Brother Isaac Walker and got him to read it for me. Though active in the church, Walker was not a full member until 10 days before his death, when he, quote, obtained the pardon of his sins, after which he manifested an unshaken confidence in God to the last moment. End quote. While Walker was a strong presence in a variety of ways in the Wyandotte Reserve, he also bridged the gap to the surrounding white world in personal and political ways. On June 28, 1822, Isaac married Rebecca Hamlin, a white widow with two young daughters from her first marriage. The marriage was solemnized by a Methodist minister and legalized by filing a license in Crawford County, the new county that was created, which included the Grand Reserve. Okay. This was a growing trend amongst some Wyandots in the 1820s to solemnize their marriages through legal licenses in county courts. Okay. The couple had one son, Isaiah, who I, is in the picture here, um, <clears throat> born in 1826, who later, whose later economic interest and identity became a key part of the story I'm going to get into. Walker's marriage outside of the tribe was not unique as many of the other progeny of adoptees chose to marry spouses from the local white community. And there seems to have been little overt stigma attached to such marriages from either the Wyandotte or white Ohioans. In a very personal way, Walker's marriage reflects the permeable, if in some ways unimportant, distinctions between Indian and white worlds drawn by successive generations of scholars. Perhaps there's no greater evidence of Walker's assertion of a new kind of identity than his exercise of the franchise or the right to vote, which he did in 1820, 1821, excuse me. This was reserved to property and white men in Ohio at the time. In 1820, the state of Ohio created Crawford County, which included at least in part the Grand Reserve, didn't have authority over it politically, but it was within the boundaries of the county. In 1821, all 13 eligible voting men in Crawford Township got together to vote. One of them was Isaac Walker. He was the only member of the Walker family. That included his father, who was still alive and was by blood white. Okay. He was the only Wyandotte person to vote in the election. And as I say, indeed, the only Walker, the only Wyandotte period to do this. That included adoptees. Due to the exceedingly small number of voters, 
Each of the 13 voters was able to hold an elected office. Isaac was the constable of Crawford Township. Okay. He participated in all subsequent elections held in the township until his death. Though I found little detail of the elections themselves or the subsequent exercise of the duties politically, there's no evidence that either local whites or the Wyandotte Nation challenged or questioned Walker's political duality, being Wyandotte and white at the same time. He was both an important figure in the Wyandotte community and one in the local white political world, a unique position only he occupied. Isaac Walker died of an unknown illness in May 1829. He was 34 years old. His early death was not unusual on the Grand Reserve or in other indigenous communities in the region, as a variety of ailments disproportionately struck Native Americans in comparison to surrounding populations. If you know anything about contact and the Columbian Exchange, this goes all the way back to the beginning of contact with Europeans. <clears throat> With his death, of course, the story of Isaac Walker's life might seem to be over. However, the story really had only begun about his identity. By the fall of 1829, his widow sought some resolution of her property rights on the Grand Reserve. She was not Wyandotte by blood or by adoption. Therefore, typically wasn't entitled to anything on the reserve. She went to the Indian agent, John McElvain, to inquire with the Office of Indian Affairs about the matter. McLean, or McElvain, excuse me, asked the War Department to determine whether she had a valid claim, quote, she having no Indian blood in her, end quote. McElvain asked if she was entitled to a portion of the land should the Walkers decide to divide, it one, divide one off for her, and whether she had the power to sell the land to a white man, and whether said white man, quote, would be permitted to live on the Indian reservation without leave from the proper authority, which was the United States government in this case, end quote. Most importantly, <clears throat> as the case turned out, McIlvain asked whether, in the event Rebecca Walker should remarry, her, her husband would be permitted to live on the property with her, which would be customary according to American law, a month later, McIlvain again asked the Commissioner of Indian Affairs to render assistance, as Joseph Chafee, the new husband of Rebecca Walker, and his family had moved on to the Grand Reserve. The Wyandotte chiefs asked McIlvain to remove Chafee, a man who McIlvain argued, quote, is that kind of man that will take no advice, end quote. The War Department refused to take any side in the dispute between the Walkers and Rebecca and Joseph Chafee, her new husband, as it was, quote, a case of individual right, end quote, that must be settled by legal means. It's important to note that Isaac had left a last will, another custom that was becoming normalized for some Wyandots was to leave a will. He filed this will, and it was to be executed by a white man named John Carey, who lived in Crawford County. An examination of the will, there are two existing copies, a rough draft and the final version, provides an interesting insight into Isaac's life and to some extent his view of his own identity. Other than order of information, the draft differs little from the final, final copy. Isaac wished that his debts be paid from his estate as soon as convenient. The bulk of his personal property, his furniture, his carriage, his traveling trunk, his livestock, etc., was to go to his widow, aside from a few specific items he gave to his siblings, Joel, Matthew, and his sister, Nancy Garrett. His share of the improved farmland on the reservation was to be divided equally between two parties. One was his mother, Catherine, and his two minor brothers. That was one party. The other was his widow, Rebecca, and his minor son, Isaiah. In the event of a sale of the Grand Reserve, which was becoming a strong possibility in his day because of the Indian removal policy championed by Andrew Jackson, the new president, if that should happen, the proceeds would be divided accordingly, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me, along the same lines. He did include the provision that his wife, quote, continue to reside here in the Walker family household, end quote. Despite this proviso, Isaac Walker seems to have prepared for the event that either Rebecca or his family, or both perhaps, would wish to sever the attachment between her and the family. And he authorized the executor of his will to appropriate enough money to buy two 80-acre lots off of reservation that his wife could then use. Okay. He also asked the executor to locate one section of land on the reservation do Isaac by the 1817 treaty he helped 1817 treaty he hoped to, he helped to negotiate, 
and make sure that that was set apart for his son Isaiah. So Isaiah would inherit his right to an individual plot of reservation land. Okay. Finally, as a final codicil to the will, Isaac asked the executor to set aside $700 to be used by his wife at any time she chose and to take the remainder of his money and put it in an interest yielding bank account. The interest could be used by Rebecca, but the principal was owned by his son Isaiah and would become his at the time he became an adult. Okay. Technically, according to the will, all other property and the actual balance of the account aforementioned would be used by his son Isaiah, which was his only heir, his only living child. For, uh, excuse me, by 1833, the Wyandotte Council decided to intercede in the Isaac Walker affair directly. So about four years after his death, the tribal council gets involved in this legal wrangling. Noting provisions in the treaty signed in 1817 and 1818, they gave John Kerry permission to locate a 640-acre section of land for the use and possession of Isaiah Walker, the only child of Isaac. It's important to note that this land was specifically for Isaiah's possession and use, not Chafee's. They were very clear on that in the agreement that was made. Chafee wrote the War Department in his capacity as Isaiah Walker's guardian, he was his stepfather after all, to clarify whether the aforementioned land would be deeded to Isaiah, upon which Chafee would enter the land and improve it, quote, for the benefit of the heir, end quote. So until he became an adult, which is going to be, what, 12 more years, Chafee would effectively own Isaiah's land and improve it for him. Chafee also asked the department whether or not leases agreed to by the chiefs for long terms, 10 or 20 year terms, would be binding even if the Wyandots were removed. So would that land continue to be leased land or would it be sold to the public? The Office of Indian Affairs informed Chafee that Isaac Walker's name was not on the 1817 treaty as an individual beneficiary of a section of land. Nor did the Wyandots have the legal ability to lease lands to US citizens which would therefore not entitle such illegal leaseholders to keep the lease land in the case of removal. So effectively, the Wyandotte could do whatever they wanted on their land, but it had no legal standing in American courts. Okay. In the years following <clears throat> Isaac's death, relations between the Walker family and Joseph Chafee seem to have soured continuously. William Walker Jr., brother of Isaac Walker, told missionary James B. Finley that the Walker family had engaged in lawsuits against both John Carey and Chafee regarding Isaac's property. Another example is an 1831 newspaper announcement filed by George Garrett. Garrett was married to Isaac's sister Nancy. He was a white man but married to the Walker family, who had apparently given Chafee a note of hand for $190 on November 1819. Garrett warned readers that should Chafee attempt to sell the note, this was common practice, to sell a debt to someone else, they could collect it later, that Garrett refused to pay, quote, unless compelled by law, end quote. However, the single most important document for reconstructing Isaac Walker's post-death story was actually written five years after his death. By 1834, after all this wrangling that's been going on, a lawsuit initiated by Joseph Chafee in Crawford County wound its way into the Ohio Supreme Court, where Walker's complicated identity had to be untangled. While the lawsuit was ostensibly about a lease agreement, the crux of the matter was the identity of Isaac Walker. As noted, following his death, his widow had remarried this guy Joseph Chafee. By standard American law, Chafee had acquired Rebecca's property at the time of marriage which included a half interest in the Walker place. He had chosen to lease the property for a year's term, but the lessee and adopted Wyandotte failed to pay on the grounds that the land was Wyandotte land and not subject to Chafee's ownership. So Chafee sought to define his rights in court. So he's suing to get paid for a lease. The lessee is saying, or the lessor, I guess you would say, um, is saying, I don't have to pay you because you don't actually own the land. The heart of the argument about the case was whether Isaac Walker had the ability to will property to his wife and whether that property was transferable to her non-Wyandotte husband. Chafee's lawyer, relying on standard American property rights, rested his claim on the argument that, quote, Isaac claimed to be a citizen of the United States and exercised the privilege of voting at elections. 
though he also received his dividend of the annuities secured by the treaties to be paid to the Wyandotte Nation of Indians as one of the nation, end quote. So he was both. He had been white, voted in American elections, but also was a beneficiary of treaty rights. Isaac had expended, quote, a large sum of money in improving his inherited land, end quote, and the plaintiff claimed that his widow and young son, and Chafee by extension, had a right to that property and the improvements, improvements thereon. The defense conversely argued that while under normal statutes the plaintiff should win, the fact that Walker lived as a Wyandotte on Wyandotte land precluded the white plaintiff from winning the case. Based on the existing federal laws, particularly the Indian Intercourse Act of 1802, non-Indians could not possess, rent, lease, or use indigenous lands without federal approval by treaty. The defense ultimately argued that, quote, assuming that Isaac Walker was one of the Wyandotte tribe, subject to the usages and laws of the Indians, we conclude that his last will must be carried into effect according to the laws and usages of the sovereign power, in this case the Wyandotte nation is the sovereign power, whose citizen and subject he was, end quote. Walker's will, therefore, was only enforceable by the Wyandotte government. According to this logic, Walker was subject to the power of his sovereign nation, the Wyandotte nation, who of course did not allow non-citizens to possess or control land on the reserve. This judgment of the state Supreme Court concurred with the defense. So they, they ruled against Chafee. The court argued that Walker inherited his property rights from his father, a member of the Wyandotte tribe. And the plaintiff, not being a member of the tribe and line of succession, did not possess title to the land. Though the court did not decide whether Isaac Walker was legally a Wyandotte or a white man, his proprietary rights, if they existed at all, were based on his status as a Wyandotte citizen. So effectively, the court said, legally, you are a Wyandotte person, regardless of whatever else you did in your life. Despite the finding against his rights in the court case, Chafee continued to press both his claim and the question of Isaiah's lands. Again, writing as Isaiah's guardian, Chafee wrote the War Department to assure them that Isaac Walker was indeed listed on the 1817 treaty, but by his Wyandotte name, not as Isaac Walker. He enclosed a certificate from the Wyandotte chiefs clarifying that Isaac was indeed listed on the treaty. Chafee uh, wished the president to approve a deed to Isaiah, which Chafee would of course control until he became an adult. The War Department asked the new Indian agent, Purdy McIlvain, brother of John McIlvain, to investigate the claims and determine their validity. The Wyandotte Council did indeed confirm that Isaac Walker was listed by his Wyandotte name on the 1817 treaty, and they approved the land selected by John Kerry on Isaiah's behalf. So they approved of that for Isaiah's ownership, as they had said before. The chiefs, William Walker and Joseph Chafee, all signed the communications. They all agreed that this was Isaiah's property. Despite the assertions and actions of the Wyandotte Council, the Walker family, and Chafee, however, the War Department determined the chiefs had no power to grant Isaiah Walker individual land. According to the Treaty of 1817, the entire Grand Reserve had been granted to the chiefs by patent and fee simple. For simple use, it was co collectively owned by the whole community. Okay. What that meant was, <clears throat> quote, for the use of the persons mentioned in the schedule annexed to the treaty of whom Isaac Walker was one, he's simply one of many people listed as having rights on the land. This meant that the chiefs held a trust grant, which meant the lands were for the equal and common use of the persons named in the schedule. Not only did Isaac Walker through his father not have a right to individual land ownership, none of the Wyandots did. It couldn't be owned individually because that's not how the land had been deeded to them effectively. The only entity the Wyandots could convey their land to was the United States government. That's it. Okay. While the War Department's finding dashed Chavey's hopes of access to land through his stepson Isaiah, he refused to allow the, the Ohio Supreme Court decision to deter his, his claims for compensation. So he couldn't get the land, but he's still trying to get money owed, he believed, for the property. He again contacted the War Department for, quote, a debt due me in right of my wife, end quote, for the improvements Isaac Walker made between 1823 and 1829. He bitterly complained that upon marriage to Rebecca, he pressed his claims to Catherine Walker, mother of Isaac, who, quote, refused to give them up or to pay rent for them by shielding herself under the federal laws regarding Indian affairs, end quote. 
He acknowledged that the court and bank decision, the Supreme Court decision, went against him for want of jurisdiction, so he chose to appeal directly to the War Department, of course in charge of Indian Affairs, <clears throat> for restitution. Eventually, Chafee sought compensation after the Wyandots signed a removal treaty in 1842. So the Wyandots agreed to leave Ohio in 1842. As part of that treaty agreement, the federal government agreed to pay any debts owed by the Wyandot people. So creditors had to go file with the Indian agent, and he had to determine whether these debts were valid or not. Okay? Well, Chafee tried to file these debts. He presented his claims to John Johnston, the Indian agent who negotiated the removal, and Purdy McIlvain, the agent locally. They both, he claimed, deemed the, je the debts just, but not payable without federal approval. The Walkers, for their part, argued that they owed him nothing, and he had no ability to press them directly for claims because of the treaty provision that said any existing Wyandotte debt would be paid by the federal government. Okay. As for Isaac's Wa Isaac Walker's property, he writes, the Wyandotte Tribal Council, seemingly at the urging of William Jr., passed a re resolution in the 1830s that secured title to his buildings, physical property, and land rights to his young son, Isaiah, as well as recognizing Isaiah as a Wyandotte citizen. That was critical because Isaiah was only by blood an eighth Wyandotte and technically wasn't entitled to citizenship later but the special provision was made to make sure that he was a citizen. Isaac Walker's descendants continued to exercise their Wyandotte identities after removal to Kansas and later Oklahoma. I'll talk about that in a minute. Where his kin became leading figures within and without the Wyandotte community. So to kind of wrap this story up uh, for a few minutes, I should project this forward a bit. Okay. So the Wyandotte, as I mentioned, agreed to remove in 1842. They have actually left physically in 1843, and they moved from Northwest Ohio into what's now Northeastern Kansas, okay? Most Northern native peoples were moved to Kansas. Most Southern native people were moved to the Indian Territory, what's later Oklahoma. From 1843 to 1855, the Wyandotte Nation, they actually start, start to spell it differently in Kansas with a T-E on the end. The Wyandotte Nation held lands in, I said northwestern, it should be northeastern Kansas, including what is now Kansas City, Kansas, across from Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, the Wyandots actually found what becomes Kansas City, Kansas. Okay. In 1855, the U.S. concluded a treaty to allot all of the Wyandotte lands in Kansas to individuals, so they divided it into private ownership, and make the Wyandotte people citizens of the United States, basically arguing that they had been acculturated enough that they could be U.S. citizens. Okay? But some Wyandotte people did not want to take these individual allotments. They wanted to continue living a tribal national existence. So, in 1867, a separate treaty allowed some of the Wyandots to move south into the Indian Territory and continue to live collectively as a tribal group. Okay? And they end up here on a very small reservation in extreme northeastern Oklahoma. Okay? Uh, and you see this blow up. That's where the people who were moved to Kansas and Missouri end up, is in that little corner of northeastern Oklahoma. There is a city, and if you've ever been to Oklahoma, there's a city called Miami, spelled Miami, pronounced Miami. That's how the Miami would refer to themselves, the people. Um, Miami is the capital for like a dozen different groups because they all live in this little area of what's now Oklahoma. <clears throat> so this small reservation is indicated on the map. The, the person I'm going to close with, the grandson of Isaac Walker, Bertrand Walker, I'll talk about him in a minute, relocated to this reservation from Kansas in 1874. So his family moved a few years after this treaty went into effect out of Kansas and into what's called Wyandotte, Oklahoma. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And I mentioned just to carry this forward to the present so you're aware, there are four distinct recognized in one form or another Wyandotte groups today. The only federally recognized group is the Wyandotte Nation of Oklahoma, who are still, uh, well at least a, a significant percentage of them are still in Northeast Oklahoma. 
There is also a Wyandotte nation of Kansas. These are the people who took the allotments in the 1850s and 60s. And they are still organized as a, na nash, nash, excuse me, a nation, but they're not federally recognized. There's a third group in Michigan and in Ontario on both sides of the border called the Wyandotte of Anderdon. Okay. And they also aren't federally recognized, though they actually have dual citizenship because by treaty, Wyandotte people on the border did. They're Canadian and US and yeah. And then the fourth group is in Canada, it's in Quebec, and this is called the uh, Nation Huron Wendat, okay? And their capital is Wendaki, which is basically a suburb of Quebec City, okay? <clears throat> so just a little bit about that. So to close this discussion, I wanted to follow this through to another generation. I'm skipping over Isaiah in part because I don't have a lot of information about him, uh, but the other reason is, um, I think connecting Isaac to his grandson Bertrand makes sense, and I'll talk about why. Despite all the changes the Wyandots had gone through in Ohio, and in the long years after removal, the merging of old and new of tradition and change continued to shape Wyandot life. A prime example of this was Hento, or Bertrand N.O. Walker, son of Isaiah Walker. Hento was born in Kansas in 1870 to Isaiah Walker and Mary Williams. Mary Williams' family was also a prominent mixed ancestry family. The Walkers moved to the Indian Territory in 1874 to Wyandotte, Oklahoma, where Bertrand spent most of the rest of his life. Bertrand received his education at the local government boarding school, which was called the Seneca Industrial School and through a private tutor, and also briefly attended public school in Seneca, Missouri, which is just across the border from Wyandotte. <clears throat> Hento spent much of his adulthood working in various capacities for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, in some ways replicating his grandfather's government service from decades earlier. He spent several years as a school teacher in boarding schools in California and Arizona as well as near home at the Seneca Industrial School that he himself had attended. After taking some years away from government employment, he finished his working life as a clerk for the BIA, mostly at the Quapaw Agency, which is the agency that runs that part of Northeast Oklahoma. <clears throat> In addition to his work with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a particular passion of Bertrand Walker's was writing. In addition to poetry, which he published in several local publications and boarding school newspapers, he also engaged in a years-long effort to collect and publish many traditional stories of his people, the Wyandotte. In particular, he viewed this in the vein of others interested in collecting information at the same time from older Native Americans. In the early 20th century, there's an ongoing process, sometimes it's called salvage anthropology, uh, or folklorism, a lot of folklorists do this, trying to collect stories from old people who remembered traditions before they were going to be gone, is the idea, okay? So, Walker, like others, was engaged in the same kind of process, but he was doing it from the inside rather than from the outside. However, another aspect of his collecting work was to give voice to elders for who, from, whom, from whom future generations of Wyandots could learn perpetuating traditions using the fairly new Native American medium of writing. Hento, a product of American educational systems, American-based employment, and mostly racially white, quote unquote, in some ways represents the majority of Wyandotte people of his time, and indeed can be regarded as a newer iteration of the same duality as I talked about with his grandfather. Despite the evidence of his adaptation, some might argue assimilation, some have argued that, that he was an assimilated person. Um, <clears throat> Hento was also a product of Wyandotte traditions, reaching back before contact with Americans or Christianity, a product of connections to both the present of his day and the past of his people through stories, clan identity, he's part of the Big Turtle clan, and historical memory. The tales he collected reflected not just the quote unquote dying traditions of a people, but the living importance of such tales and traditions for 20th century Wyandots, even those as seemingly acculturated as Hento himself. Nowhere is this better represented than in his most significant work, a collection of Wyandot stories called Tales of the Bark Lodges, which was published in 1919. In these stories, Walker represents himself as a young Wyandot child of mixed ancestry, 
approaching his elders with a thirst for their old traditions and stories. One passage in particular from the first story in the book, I think, really reflects kind of Walker's positioning of himself in this. So I'm going to read a little bit from that story. And I'll tell you, it's in a dialectical form. This is a popular form of writing. If you're familiar with the Br'er Rabbit stories, uh, kind of, or Zora Neale Hurston's books, you know, this kind of dialectical style, uh, native people wrote in that style too a lot of times. So I'll work through that. You all the time said, an old Wyandotte story, what for? He's about all gone now. Wyandotte, you know, just a little bit. Your father, your mother, just a little bit more Wyandotte than you. Look, your hair just like a sunshine if you catch him and tie him in a bunch. Wyandotte, his hair black like a night and fine, just like your sister yonder. Eyes black too. He's and your mother and me, we all looks like Wyandotte. The boy replying to his old aunt, he's talking to his aunt, said, yes, I know, but Nia, Nia is a kind of a effective affection term, okay? I'm a Wyandotte, even if my hair is like what you say. And you know, I just love to hear you tell me all the old stories, the little Wyandotte children. Yes, and the older ones too, listened to so many, many years ago. That is before they ever knew there was such a thing as a white man, I guess. I like to hear all about the olden times you often tell me about, and how the Wyandots lived and did things then. Anyway, you know that as long as I can claim a little bit of Wyandot blood, I am an Indian, a Wyandot, and not a white man. His aunt was pleased with this response. Okay. This passage, I think, captures the self-perception of Hento himself. Though he and his people had changed over time, that's what history is after all, the change over time, as a result of contact with Americans, a process represented by his own grandfather's story two generations before, their Wyandotte identity endured, regardless of blood quantum education or economic livelihoods. Like his grandfather Isaac, Bertrand Walker, Hento, asserted that the traditions and identities of the Wyandotte people had endured through the changes wrought by exposure to American culture, education, and society, leaving the Wyandotte's product of both American and Wyandotte tradition. To sum up this point, I'm going to quote one more time. This is from the introduction to Tales of the Bark Lodges that Walker wrote. This is, or excuse me, the foreword, the initial section. He said, quote, amalgamation with the civilized races had lessened the degree of Indian blood and they had become a civilized people. They were educated more or less and were possessed of an innate refinement of thought and manner. With all that they had gained from civilization, they retained and cherished closely many of their old manners and customs, adapting them to the ever-changing times." End quote. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I guess I should conclude. Uh, the Wyandotte Nation of Oklahoma still exists today uh, and exerts far more national life than they did for many years, including the years that Bertrand Walker was alive. Uh, number about 5,000 today. Uh, and that's enrolled members, and then there are many who are connected in some way that aren't necessarily enrolled. Uh, if you add up all the Wyandotte people together, you're talking 20,000, 25,000 people. So, you know, a decent sized community collectively. Most of the efforts to catalog the Wyandotte language were by French priests, and it was just ph basically phonetic spelling, trying to phonetically capture in French at that time or in English later. Um, yeah, words. It's mainly a word list. Uh, I mentioned John Johnston. He's an Indian agent. He compiled a lot of these for Wyandotte and Delaware and Shawnee. These are people he worked with for a long time. And they're mainly just lists of this is what rabbit is, this is what bird is, and it's spelled out phonetically. There are audio recordings from the early 20th century of Wyandotte elders speaking and singing and that kind of thing. Um, like many people in this part of Oklahoma, Northeast Oklahoma, uh, the Wyandotte language stopped being spoken in the mid 20th century as fluent, a fluent language, basically. Uh, there were still people who spoke smatterings of uh, Wyandotte, and there's an ongoing effort, as is true with like the Miami and other people, to revitalize the language. Um, I'm friends with a guy who is one of the teachers at the Wyandotte Language School. And he, he admits, he says, I basically keep a, a, basically a lesson or two ahead of the students because he, he didn't grow up speaking the language either. But there's an effort to really, especially with Wyandotte youth that are in Wyandotte, Oklahoma, to try to 
uh, revitalize the language. It seems to be working. They're also doing this in Canada, I should mention, at Quebec. Uh, there's a very strong language program there now, too. But they're relying heavily on, actually, these old dictionaries. There are 30 different dictionaries that were compiled, and like at least 100 other sources that had partial dictionaries in them. So, and they're also working with Senecas. Uh, Seneca is still a spoken language, and it's the most closely related to, to Wendat of existing languages. So there's a lot of um, usage of Seneca language scholars to help kind of rebuild uh, the Wendat language, too. I really feel, from what I know, that Isaac didn't think of himself. He didn't compartmentalize being American or Native American. That's just what he was. He was both at the same time. And... Um, not to say there's not a struggle between that, because they're not always cooperative forces, but um, from what I've learned about him, and what I think can be learned about him, um, this, this kind of idea that I'm, I'm walking between worlds, that's, a, that's been a big thing in Native history, the two worlds idea that, you know, I'm American and I'm also Native American, and it's hard to be both at the same time. I'm not saying it wasn't hard, but I'm saying, you know, it, I think he was able to do that to some degree and not really consciously think about, well, I'm being an American now and I'm being Native American here. And, but um, I should mention, um, his brother didn't necessarily, Walt William didn't necessarily say this too much, but one of the Armstrongs, uh, the son of Robert Armstrong, one of them, who was a, an attorney and actually helped try to fight legal cases for the Wyandots in the 1840s, um, he talked a lot about this how he felt like he was both part of and not part of the Wyandotte community. And it's interesting, some of his letters, he actually, sometimes he refers to us, and sometimes he refers to them <laughs> when referring to the Wyandots. So it's an interesting, it's interesting, you know, we're, we're, you're kind of, you're making educated guesses when is somebody just casually using the word them, or they really mean, I don't really view myself as part of that group at this, in this particular way. Um, I would have to think Isaac might have struggled with that at times. And, you know, indigenous students today, I have lots of them in class, and, you know, th they'll tell me individually. So anecdotally, you know, you do feel in some ways that you're kind of straddling different traditions and cultures, and it's not always easy to fit into one or the other. Well, and that's something I talk about more in my bigger research is basically racial identity and how it's forming, because this is really... I mean, if you know the history of race and race theory in the U.S., the 1820s, 30s, 40s, that's really when a lot of this is percolating. And it's interesting. It's not until really the 1830s that I see much evidence of Wyandotte people themselves actually caring about race all that much. But then there's something interesting going on, and that is some traditional Wyandots, even some that had mixed ancestry, start to look on families like the Walker family and say they're not really, <laughs> they're not really us. Okay? Uh, there was actually an effort uh, when the removal treaty was signed to cut out people of a quarter blood or less. Okay? There were actually some traditional chiefs who went to the federal government and asked to have them cut out. But then, of course, these guys aren't going to let that happen, so they oppose it, and it never actually happens. But, um, but yes, it's, it's interesting because at this particular moment this, that, my, that my main story is taking place here, there's a growing consciousness about race, and uh, appearance is, part, is a significant part of it. It's not all of it. It's really lifestyle as much as anything. But, um, yeah, I mean, people would... Um, and I've actually had students just kind of talk about, you know, William Walker, and it's partially because of his age. I mean, he looks native to some students. You know, Joel Walker, less so, even though they're completely brothers by blood. <laughs> same mother, same father. Um, and Bertrand Walker, and that's why I quoted his kind of himself being the fictional child in the story. Yeah, Bertrand Walker had blonde hair and blue eyes. and um, But... Um, did speak some Wyandot. He wasn't fluent, but he spoke enough that he actually could hold conversations with native speakers. And um, yeah, I mean, it's one of those interesting things, right? And it's clearly critical to na modern Native American history is how do you navigate kind of the importance of race 
even though we all know race is socially constructed, it still is meaningful, <laughs> okay? And uh, for the Wyandotte, it's more it's both more and less complicated because even the Wyandotte themselves today, uh, most of them argue the last full-blood Wyandotte died in the 1820s, <laughs> okay? Most of the people in the community at this time were of mixed ancestry. Sometimes with Americans, actually usually with French or English ancestry. And then those who were fully native were often not just Wyandotte, they were Seneca or Mohawk or Delaware or something else. Um, and then there were some African Americans that were intermarried too. And so you have people of mixed ancestry that way. Um, simply put, I've not seen compelling evidence that of racial determinism, I would say. But there's definitely a tension there. Like after they get to Kansas, um, the tribal council decides to boot out all of the black people <laughs> in the community. Um, people who were not of mixed, people who were adoptees. So people who had a Wyandotte ancestor, they couldn't kick out that way. But um, there was a really famous, by, by standards of this day, a famous woman named Nancy Wright who was black and had married into the community. And basically they, they took all of her rights away from her. And then there's a struggle in terms of religion. Do they, do they continue to affiliate with the Northern Methodist or Southern Methodist when they break up over slavery? Um, and a percentage of the population, uh, the Walkers being one of them, wanted to join with the Southern Church. And actually, William Walker is the first man known to have bought a black slave amongst the Wyandots, too. Um, he struggled with it, but used them because it was legal in, well, it was legal in Kansas till later. Yeah, it, you can generally say, in a general way, the people who are of mixed ancestry might generally be more prone to economic change. But uh, one thing I talk about in my own work, it's never that simple. There are some people who, are, who exert no mixed ancestry at all, who are not affiliated with the Methodist Church, and they're amongst the wealthiest people financially on the reservation. Because they're, they're participating in you know, buying and selling goods. They sell goods to the local white general stores to be sold. They raise cattle and sell in markets in Columbus and places like that. And you know, sometimes it's these guys, but sometimes it's actually the most unassimilated people doing that. So I think there are connections, but I think they're often overblown. Um, most of the work on this is done with the Cherokee, actually, Cherokee adaptation. And uh, even in that field, you know, they've said it's a little more complicated than saying, you know, the mixed ancestry people were wealthier or were more prone to engage in buying and selling goods. And the Walkers ran this general store and they ran up huge debt and they were getting sued all the time. But um, <clears throat> But a lot of the wealthier, not a lot, some of the wealthier Wyandots, more than would just be an abnormality, are not actually very assimilated in any way. Um, so it's an interesting, I think there's a connection, but it's not a very strong connection between the race, identity, your ancestry, whatever, however you want to put it, uh, economics, religious adaptation, that kind of thing. There are connections, but they're not as strong as I think would be assumed, at least here. How did I come to the topic? Um, well, I'm from Ohio originally. Um, I wanted to do something lo located in Ohio because I just knew it better and I knew there were lots of things that hadn't really been explored very much. Um, Ohio as a state has a very rich Native American history, but practically no attention was paid to it other than Tecumseh. I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, but, I mean, Joseph Brandt was born in Ohio and Pontiac and, you know, a lot of very key figures in this story. And so I was looking around. I knew this community had existed up here, and it had lasted longer than the other indigenous communities. I wanted to do something in the 19th century mostly, uh, partially because there are more documents available, partially, I hate to admit it, I didn't really want to learn French very well, and I would have had to if I'd gone further back with this community because it goes back to the French period. Um, <clears throat> I've done a little with French sources, but not too much. Um, and there hadn't been a whole lot done. There's been a little bit done in the last 15 years on this, but really not very much at all. 
And in terms of records, there are more for this community, I think, than the other communities around here. Uh, there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, more Wyandotte people are literate than, let's say, the Shawnee or the Seneca or the Delaware that are living right around here. And um, particularly, this guy wrote a lot. And a folklorist in the 20th century, one of these guys that actually was working with Bertrand Walker for a while, um, collected most of his papers. And they're in mainly in two places. Uh, one, they're at the University of Kansas archives, some of them. Uh, but most of them are at the Kansas City, Kansas Public Library. <laughs> okay. They have a huge archive there, which very few people know about and hardly anybody uses. Um, and they have most of the letters that this guy wrote. Um, and it's almost inaccessible. At least it was when I did the research because the reference librarian was in charge of the collection and you had to work around her schedule and she would only give you an hour and a half to two hours at a time to do research because she couldn't give you any more time. And she had had bad experiences with people just wanting to go in there and browse. And so she, had to, she has to go pull every document and she basically hated working with researchers, but I went and I knew it because there there's a guide in the library. I went through and picked the ones I really wanted to look at, and since I knew what I was doing, it worked better. But Because it used to be an open collection, like anybody could just walk in and get 200-year-old letters out and look at them, because they didn't have really a way of preserving these or anything. Most of them still had metal paper clips on them, which is, if you know anything about archiving, you never do. Um, <clears throat> But in terms of other resources, there are a lot of government documents, of course, because the Bureau of India, what was called the Office of Indian Affairs then, was very active. And this community particularly, there were a lot of negotiations with and efforts to sign treaties. There's a lot of material there. The missionaries left stuff behind. And there's an archive of Ohio Methodism at Ohio Wesleyan University. They lock you in a little cage, and you're in there with the, <laughs> with the documents. Um, but I had to travel um, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Kansas, Missouri, Oklahoma to do the research. Okay? So it took a lot of time and fortunately I had enough grant money from here and there to pay for most of it. But um, there's a lot of little archives, big archives, went to several state archives and university archives and it's for a group like this that moves so much so quickly, it's just piecing it together is, is, just takes time. And even the stuff that's been published in the last 15 years, none of it uses all of this stuff. They use some of it, but not all the pieces because they didn't actually look at all the pieces. Um, so, yeah. It's a lot of lonely <laughs> reading documents and trying to decipher crappy handwriting and then you hope beyond hope they let you copy the documents. Some places will, some places won't. Some places let you take pictures, some won't. <laughs> Sometimes you have to sit and just hand write it or type it. Some places won't let you bring, they may probably do now, a few archives I went to wouldn't let you take a computer in. If you wanted notes, you had to hand write it in pencil on a piece of paper, that was all you could do. And the, but then some places are real finicky about pictures of any kind of their documents. And I mean, an ongoing thing is the digital, digitization of, of archives. And some places don't want to do it because they want people to have to come to the archive. And if you don't, if you put them all online, why are they going to bother coming anymore? Um, so, yeah, a friend, of, a colleague of mine who teaches at Miami University in Ohio, um, he's actually an art historian, but really got interested in this history. And he's been trying to put a digital archive together for 10 years at least. And he's made some headway, but getting permissions to use these things digitally is tedious. But I'm really interested in consumerism. So I did some stuff with consumerism, what people are buying. And there's a really good surviving ledger from a, an off-reservation store from the 1820s and early 1830s. Uh, and that's, that's been microfilmed. It's at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Um, but there's another one which would be way better, which is, it's actually a ledger from the Walker store. <laughs> and it's at the Oklahoma State Historical Society, but 
people didn't think it was important over the years because it's just an old ledger from a store who, the, who cares, it doesn't even exist anymore, the store. So a lot of the pages have been pasted over with like people pasted newspaper articles and stuff over in it. And they've tried to remove them, but it damages the writing underneath. So you can only read about, I'd say about a quarter of the ledger entries because of this. And it's, it's one of those many things, it's tantalizingly you wish there was more of it, but at least there's something to work with. Um, but yeah. Um, when you bring up, you know, women, um, maybe certainly the best known, probably the most important woman on the reserve was Catherine Walker, the, 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 yeah, the mother of this whole family. Um, and she's from a very prominent background. Uh, one of her ancestors was Andrew Montour, who was a very notable uh, trader. I mentioned her father was Isaac Rankin, a very notable uh, fur trader and a British official. Um, a, a colleague of mine who does women's, actually does women's WINDAT history, she does mainly Canadian stuff, but she's been digging into the Catherine Walker story as much as we can get of it. The problem is, I think Catherine Walker could write, but I've never found anything she wrote. Um, and I've talked to descend, you know, modern descendants of the Walker family and uh, many of them don't seem to know of any <laughs> writings of hers either. Uh, but another figure who's kind of like Rebecca in a way uh, is a woman named Lucy Bigelow. Her father was one of the ministers that was a missionary here. She married this guy, John Armstrong, the guy I mentioned before who struggled with his identity. And she, she and he left a huge correspondence behind. And there are some really interesting insights, not just to what this mixed marriage meant to both of them, but there's a lot about their opinions of other Wyandotte people, which are really interesting. Lucy Bigelow, Lucy Bigelow is her name, <laughs> yes. Um, and most of her papers are at uh, the county, ar there's a county archive in, in Wyandotte County in Kansas City, um, and a lot of her papers are there. And there's correspondence between her and her husband from the 1830s up through the 1870s, I think. And then she continued, she was widowed for a long time, but she continued to really be an active part of the Wyandotte community. And she would actually speak at local historical meetings and stuff like that about the Wyandots. And um, my friend's also doing a little work with her uh, in that material, but I don't think she's published anything about it yet. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah.